Hello everybody and uh, welcome to uh, a rather special Frank and Stan chat. This is part of the Spotlight series where we uh, ask a colleague to come and chat to us and uh, we don't have the sort of stuff like what's going on in education this week. It's more about, you know, what stuff is this person getting involved in? You know, why are they doing this? So uh, that's what this uh, chat is all about and I'm delighted to say we've got uh, Ross McGill um, at the bottom of the screen. Hello Ross. Hi Frank, hi Stan, hello everyone. Yeah, and you can see from the t-shirt he's part of the teacher toolkit, which you may know him more from that than from uh, Ross McGill. Also, uh, your your posh name is one with the Ross Morrison McGill. I wasn't. Well, quite... it's because there's an there's already a writer out there in Canada, I believe, uh, a doctor who's published books called Ross McGill. So my publisher said, look, you've got to put your middle name on your book. So I had to let, and I wasn't comfortable with Morrison to begin with. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not double barreled. It's just my middle name. So there you go. <laughs> I think it looks very good on the books. I will say that. Thank you. <laughs> As you can see, uh, Ross is, I wouldn't say prolific writer, but there are a number of books. And obviously, he has a, a website as well, which is full of uh, interesting stuff and is updated regularly. So um, before we get to Ross, would you say, how are you stand today? Fine, fine. Good, good day, I think. Yeah, well, it's, but it's October, so you expect that. And it's uh, weird because this is midweek. We normally do our yeah. chats on a Friday morning. So uh, right. here we are. So, Ross, who are you and what do you actually do? That's a good question. Um, depends where you want to start from, I suppose. Um, I, 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 if I focus on education, I, um, I went to seven state schools as a child, as a free school meals child. Um, my mum and dad were Salvation Army officers working in the social services. So back in the day, they were deployed to various hostels, I suppose, children's hostels, men's hostels. And we always lived in an annex of the building. So um, Scotland, Wales, England, um, farms, hostels, children's homes, those kind of things. So that was my uh, upbringing, um, you know, playing snooker and darts alongside schizophrenics and drug addicts after school. Uh, seeing the odd dead body here or there, uh, violence, things like that. So it's quite a fascinating childhood looking. Do you think, though, that, how much do you think that has influenced you? Uh, significantly, because, you know, all my family are involved in some kind of service. Right. And uh, I, I guess that's why I also loved working in very challenging schools, because I was just used to that lifestyle. Uh, it was where I was most comfortable um, so yeah, um, I never really settled down and, you know, known a lot more about academic research and student outcomes. I now see why that mobility issue for myself, I struggle to get my qualifications at school. So long story short, I did an, an extra, extra year in sixth form, got my A-levels and off I ran to London. So we were in Blackpool at the time, right. Goldsmiths College in South East London and did a four year Bachelor of Education at Goldsmiths. I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I loved design technology. And the rest was history. I never left London after then. So I spent 26 years in uh, inner city secondary schools in North, uh, South and North London, um, all challenging schools, um, rising up to the, the heights of deputy head teacher in a school in Westminster with, you know, shy 2,000 kids, 250 staff. And, and I loved it. And um, along the way, I've uh, started blogging in 2007 uh, when the technology was available. So I just used to write a diary every half term and, you know, I had one or two people reply and uh, now it's become a full-time job. So when I, I know we're going to talk about this later, but when I decided to make the leap uh, away from teaching, um, the, the blog at the time, I think back probably about 10 million visitors at the time. So it became a full-time job on top of being a father and top of being a deputy head. So lots of different forces, something had to give. Um, but uh, today I now uh, teach toolkits full time. So it's I've got a small team that helped me. I, I guess I'm the kind of front man, I suppose. Um, I've got lots of little small business headaches, as you can imagine. But my joy is uh, unpicking academic research, making it super simple. There's probably not many aspects of education or school life that's not on the site. There's about 3,000 blogs, uh, so that's about 2 million words. And I guess I've just learned how to work quickly, long before AI. 
and uh, put it into 12 books. I've just published my 12th book. Um, there's a, um, probably 20 million visitors now today. And one, one of the headaches I've got is um, what started off as a blog or, um, you know, grab a free PDF on this link. Um, you can imagine it, it attracts lots of, uh, before we knew what the word influencer was, I, I was being demanded of those kind of things that we're now familiar with. So one thing led to another with contracts and shopping carts and all those kind of things. So I now have to manage about 150,000 teachers' email addresses and credit cards. So that comes with a lot of responsibility, privacy and data policies and things like that. So the the downsides of any business is you, you like a headship, you have to manage all the, the not-so-nice things behind the scenes. Um, but my, my favourite thing has been in schools, leading teacher training, um, you know, and, and, and that's where I, I love being the most. So I get to see schools all around the country. So... Um, seven years, probably been to 17 countries now, um, probably 105. I'm trying to keep tabs, 110,000 teachers, perhaps. Right. Um, I, the, there's, there's, it's very rarely now I get surprised with a different environment, but occasionally something is new. Oh, what's, what's the latest new one? Um, I, I suppose just going, you know, when you go and see virtual virtual reality in hair and beauty classrooms and things like that, and or golf academies and virtual schools long before the pandemic happened, you start to see, you know, what Ofsted see, I suppose, is a, a wide range of education experiences. And then when you, you see the kind of dialogue on social media, particularly on Teacher of Twitter, where things are quite binary, and I guess that secondary bubble often is viewed as the most dominant discourse when actually there's a whole range of rich approaches that uh, my favorite phrase is as many roads to Mecca. Uh, I can go on the M6, I can fly, I can take a boat. So there's many ways to mark, there's many ways to teach. Um, and that's probably been the most exciting and rewarding part of my whole career the last seven years. But it's not without its challenges. No, no, it's, I mean, Stan, what's going through my head is... Yeah, this idea of because um, actually I'm not allowed to use the word Ofsted here. Right, um, good. I like that. <laughs> but if we just say ob observing um, teachers, I think when we've done this, that we actually have um, realised that, as you say, there are many, many different approaches, and some of the approaches, you know, are very much driven by the individual, uh, what the individual brings to it, and what that character is, what they're what their personality is like, you know, in terms of how they teach. Um, so I think I really do welcome this idea that there are many, there are many routes towards, you know, effective teaching. Yeah. Um, I'm interested because in terms of the work of EEF, for example, that's something that's developed over the time of you coming out, isn't it really? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is, you know, is it, do you see that as a, as a really positive uh, situation? Or is it one that actually is sort of trying to reduce um, the sort of personality and individual nature of teaching? I, I, I see any resources now that are spread online that teachers can access as just a brilliant thing. You know, when you and I were all in the classroom, it was local authority resources if you were lucky once a year. And that was it. And whoever translated it or shared it with you. So I, I view all these books and resources and teacher blogs as a good thing. Um, I guess... You, my view is good ideas filtered to the top, and then you need to translate them and filter them back into your own context. The EEF, I think, is brilliant. Um, however, just like any organization, including myself and your own views, they are they come with their own limitations. Um, when I read um, their latest work on feedback for my new book, Guide to Feedback, um, sadly, a, a great organization still fixated on the dialogue of marketing and feedback and actually... Maybe I can talk about it a little bit later, but there's there's lots of any aspects of all our work that we can do to really build on, you know, taking the profession much further. So even big organisations, you know, the, the the name that we now will not mention and the Department for Education and other organisations, um, we all have work to do. Um, I guess we all have to recognise that it's one interpretation of how to do great teaching. Yeah. I think the worry is, and, and you get this probably over social media more than anywhere else, is the the concept somewhere that there is one way that will work everywhere and with every child, and we're just all trying to find that one way. 
And I've yeah. not believed that ever. I think we're setting ourselves up to fail if we believe for any moment that that's true. And, you know, you just need to you know, turn your social media off and walk into a classroom or a school and then you get the real reality. Um, I said to myself on my dog walk last night, every teacher, every sorry, every school leader and academic researcher should always start with this question. What would this look like for a busy classroom teacher that has to teach this to 30 kids in the next hour, how would that work? And how could I do it five times a day, 25 lessons a week? And, and that should always be our starting point. Yeah. Uh, Frank and I had an experience when we were inspecting together where we saw some absolutely stunning work in a small primary school up in Cumbria. And we both, I think, decided we would replicate this when we got back to our, our own schools. Absolute disaster. Just take <laughs> one bit of, of some stunning work and thought we could recreate it like that. Uh, how, do you avoid, how do you avoid, though, in, in your, when you're writing your books, to actually not have a preferred practice when you're writing them up? You know, so in a way, if you want to sort of, there are many roads to Mecca, as you say. But, yeah. But, you know, is, is it tempting to just say, well, by wording it in such a way, you're sort of leaning into a... It's I guess my academic brain has has learned over the years that you have to really narrow down, you know, that specificity where you've got to be super precise if you want to draw any reliable conclusions. So that laser sharp kind of pinprick focus on if we're observing something, what are we observing and who is it and when are we doing it and how will we evaluate it? All those kind of details. But again, when I when I go on to all sorts of shapes and sizes and skills. You know, from a book perspective, you want to kind of cover all kind of branches of the tree, I suppose, for sales. But, you know, sometimes that's not a good thing. The, the more precise and specific you are, I think there's a lot of beauty in being quite niche uh, with certain topics. Um, so, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think what I've learned th through my own studies is it's important to highlight your own limitations. And, I, 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 you know, when I read any academic papers, there's a good couple of paragraphs at the end of any paper with limitations. Um, the, the name that we will not mention should also maybe get some credibility by doing those kind of things too. Um, it's not a weakness. It's a, I, I view it as a strength to say, look, these ideas may not work in an early years classroom, but, you know, how would they work? And let's discuss it and support people around us. So, um, yeah, it's always worth asking those questions. How would this work uh, in a primary school? You know, I'm a secondary specialist. So if I'm in a primary leading teacher training, I am the imposter in the room. So I'm always fishing for information. How would this work with year two in maths? Um, I'd love to know. And, and, and that uh, reflective open-ended question is less threatening, uh, I hope, to the teachers in the room. And I'm actually enriching my practice uh, mm -hmm. by just understanding how my favoured ideas at work in an early years classroom. And I, I find that I'm richer for, for that conversation. I, I, I think that's a great way of shifting thinking as well, from who does this person think he is telling me how to do my teaching, to this guy wants to know how I would translate that into, yeah. he wants to use me, let me think about how I would do it. And immediately the thought process are, are very positive as opposed to you're not telling me anything. Yeah, either. absolutely. I mean, I've done a lot of work on observations and feedback conversations, difficult conversations, all those kind of things. So rather than you give me that criticism, Ross, that was a great podcast, but um, that's all I'll remember. Or, or maybe you might give me advice, Ross, the next time you're on a podcast, you should do ABC. Or, or you say, well done, we love that. that. That's not developing my practice. A a better a better approach is that suggestion. Ross, if you did another podcast, how would you do ABC differently? Uh, and that's why we should, um, we, we know teaching requires um, that approach, or reflection for, for practice. So um, I would always advocate to uh, any trainer, any school leader, any academic working with teachers, uh, if you want to kind of open doors and and, and knock down those barriers quickly, uh, listen, 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 question, question, question. Excellent. Let's go back then, Ross, to yes. uh, your time as a deputy head. Yeah. And you're sort of thinking of, well, I don't know, t take us through that journey as to, you know, you, you've got a successful career, you've probably got some responsibilities and some financial commitments and suddenly you know there must have been an idea of well you know perhaps i could step away perhaps i could 
Yeah, um, I guess it started. In fact, when I when I went for this job in 2014, it was the first school I ever went to where pretty much the whole school knew who I was. It was a very weird experience. Um, you know, London's a big place, but obviously I'd had my whole career there. And, I, you know, a statistic here, my in, in my 20 million visitors, about 15% are all based in London. So it's, you know, it's a large number of people looking at the site. So... I, I can go to different places in London and still be recognised, which is a really weird thing, that micro-celebrity status, I suppose, which is an academic term for influencer. So I found myself going to this school where the staff knew me already, and then, you know, thankfully I was successfully appointed, and uh, I'm sure you might know the school. It used to be called Quinton Kiniston. It was on an old uh, dilapidated building, and we got one of the last BSFs that were signed off by Michael Gove at the time. So we moved into a swanky new building over Christmas. And then uh, this was my first term. Uh, we had um, a bit of an international crisis. One of our ex-students was Jihadi John. So we had uh, international news cameras outside our door stop, uh, door, uh, front gate for about um, six months, wow. um, grabbing kids and staff on the street, digging out ex-staff interviews and all sorts of things. Uh, I remember my uh, head teacher being shipped off to, I don't know what the highest meeting is called at the police force, but it was kind of MI5, MI6 kind of stuff at the time being dragged off to these big meetings. Anyway, that was an interesting time. But um, once things settled down, we developed Mark Plan Teach Together, which was one of my first major books. And I guess behind the scenes, I was navigating all this dep um, teacher toolkit stuff and this influencer pressures that I was facing and the demand to do selfies this, tweet this, and come to this school and do that on top of the day job. And my, uh, I'd just gone through a bit of a traumatic time. My boy was born extremely premature, so three months early. So we were in hospital for probably 85 days down in Kent. So that was the nearest incubator at the time. So it's quite a traumatic time in my career. And I'd just been made redundant in the job before that. So moving to... This school was um, a really rewarding experience moving up the ladder uh, rather than sideways and then also getting through a personal difficulty. So I, I guess there was a multitude of factors. I was a new father. I was in a brand new shiny building, loving my responsibility. I had all this teacher toolkit, influential powers, all the good, the bad and ugly that comes with social media. And I was working in a very, very tough school, going through lots of new off um, that boogie word, I should say, incarnations of a framework, a, a legacy of the school, um, you know, all the history about the school. And then this international figure as a high profile for the school. So it was it was proper spotlight uh, stuff in the news. But behind the scenes, you know, the staff really put our heads down and work really hard and the teaching staff we developed mark plan teach together i was writing books so i i put what we did in a book and i i i just was in demand everywhere uh to go and share that kind of thinking and practice at the time um it, it's a school i absolutely love i guess a mixture of forces we had the uh, the kind of boogeyman uh kind of people come in and not say nice things um, I made a decision to go part time before that experience because I got to a point where I thought headship's not for me. I'd love to be a head teacher, but I see what other people happens to other people. The difficulties I've had in my own personal life with my son and redundancy. I don't want to put myself in the firing line where I'm going to lose my house again or or my financial back uh, setup. So that's how I teach a talk. It started in 2010 when I was made redundant for the first time. This is really early days of redundancies becoming quite normal in the teaching profession. Uh, and this was the early days of Bruce Liddington and EACT, a uh, school in Wembley. Um, so it took me two or three years to financially recover and get back on the career ladder after about three or four months. So I was I, I refused to go put myself in a position where I was on the front line where I might face a second kind of firing line. Um, so... I realized then when we had a bad um, inspection that there's no way that this very well-known income and trust would want a prolific blogger wanting to be part-time in a special measures school. Um, so I did a favor for them and I resigned and, and I guess I just helped that transition to the new school. But it was incredibly scary looking back. But 
eight years on, I've learned to trust my diary and, you, you know, every pound you earn, you, you, you have to generate. Um, so it's a very different after 25 years of a paid salary to have to earn your own. But I shouldn't have been worried, I suppose. Um, I had a 25 years of classroom experience, you know, 17 plus years of school leadership under my belt. And I'd grown this website already through adversity. So I now look at what anyone who wants to go self-employed or freelance as a congratulatory kind of step in their career that they're in a position to be able to think about making that decision. At the time, I did not think that at all. Um, but, I, you know, as soon as I took that leap and I resigned, I spent, you know, three or four months as the school started to close and me uh, leave the school, just plotting my diary, setting up processes and kind of refining some of the things that I was being asked to do for year, two or three years prior to that, you know, in a very ad hoc kind of hobby type of way to starting up a little small business. So, um, yeah, that, that was pretty much that kind of period of time. It was highly rewarding, but also highly challenging. If I look back on my mental health, my family circumstances, um, my physical health, I'm a very different place to where I was then. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, so this thing here is that I found when I re retired or partially retired, that actually suddenly things became a little bit clearer. I had a lot more time to think about processes. And, and for a stand, I mean, in the last sort of since 20, probably the last 20 odd years, I've not had to teach classes. You know, I, I've been in inspection then into sort of leadership. And it's interesting your focus is very much on teaching, isn't it? All your books are about teaching. Yeah, you? I've always been fascinated. Uh, you know, my life, it, it, all through my school lead senior leadership was all about teach the CPD role, the teaching and learning, the appraisal. So I was always about that development of others from new teachers all the way up to senior leaders. Um, so I, I developed a wide repertoire of knowledge, skills, wisdom, and then the external lens. You know, a lot of people, I, I guess what makes me one of my superpowers, I suppose, is being privy to all the Google Analytics on my website, 20 million people. I know exactly what people click on, what they read, what time of day. So it's really guided me in you know, developing a newsletter, sending out three emails a week to 100,000 teachers. I know what emails they open and what, what ones they don't and how a subject line or a paragraph makes people click things. So that guided my own leadership. And... If I'm going to stand in front of you for an hour after school for a five period day, and I know you're not going to open a newsletter, there's no way I'm going to entertain you for an hour and make you mark your books or listen to this observation. So it, it really changed the way I delivered CPD. So uh, if you dig on the internet somewhere, you might find speed date in CPD. I, I, I like to think I first generated that idea after a bottle of nine, uh, wine one night, and it was probably the most popular CPD would ever done. And then I saw the idea spread across the profession um, so little things like that about just trying to come up with, I guess, what we now know about retrieval practices, short bursts of quizzes and show and tell sessions. And rather than just it's always Ross, let's listen to Frank and Stan talk about how they use it in the primary classroom. That, that's what teachers need. And, and that's the type of model I try to deliver in schools all across the country. I, I refuse to do a full day inset because the last thing I want to do is just chat to you for five hours all day. Um, so I, I've got a nice, well-refined physical model as an external visitor, and that also offers lots of kind of pre- and post-retrieval CPD to add as much value and impact uh, and move away from that one-off experience that we've all kind of had the good, bad, and ugly experiences of. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, it, it's been an interesting journey, I suppose, from that, particularly that period of time, that decade ago, from that leadership point to where I am 10 years later. So where, where, well, we talked before, before we started recording about where teaching is going. You know, yes. You're probably in a good position, probably better than Stan and I, to sort of give a, a prediction or to, to give a sense of the direction of this. Um, do you, I, I suppose not wanting to lead, but it, I'm interested in, we've come through a period of quite sort of, some elements of political interference in teaching, you know, um, going yeah. to national strategies, to be honest. But actually, I'm just interested in terms of whether or not you think 
you know, a lot could be achieved if there was just less interference and, and more time for this reflective approach. Yeah. And just thinking also about the future with AI and, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the possibilities that that might open up. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we need accountability, but sometimes it hinders innovation. And often, you know, when some of my best books have case studies of skills and what they're actually doing on the ground, they often are the most successful because it allows other people that are doing the job to see how other people deal with the same challenges but are, are successful as a result. Um, you know, if we go back to the pandemic, we, we all believed there was going to be a global reset in lots of kind of systemic issues, for example, exams. Um, but we've all defaulted back to what we always done before. And I guess that's a need for, at least at a government level, where there's power and influence and control and a bit of cash, you know, AQA and exam boards and things like that, where we, we need to get, you know, that bell curve and the measures and all those kind of things. So we just keep on going, doing what we've always done. So I, I guess we break down, you know, our, our daily lives. Parents still... You know, although we've got a largely a hybrid model, not all of us can sit at home and do a podcast like we're doing now. You've still got people that have to physically turn up for their jobs, whatever whatever role or level of income yeah. they're on. So if I've got kids, I need to someone I've got to send them physically to a school building. The other issue is, you know, with this AI revolution is will will they be sitting in a lecture hall in front of an AI robot teacher? I hope not. Um, but how can AI improve how we all work we're already starting to see um lots of great solutions lots of copycats mm -hmm. lots of kind of ugly solutions lots of kind of same sameness and not really making much of a difference you know i had my five minute lesson plan out a good 15 years ago developed an ai version two or three years ago and now the government have chucked 40 40 million quid or something at a very well-known organization to produce the same thing so you know we need competition we need lots of different possibilities that people can use there's many ways to do things many roads to mecca but um sometimes we waste a lot of effort and income when we don't need to um ai has been great you know i've been playing around with open ai a couple of years before chat gpt looking at it for my academic work but um i get i i've very calmed down with it all now and i think most of us have, but we're all still flooded with add-ons and solutions to all the bits of software that we already use. Some of it's useful, some of it's not, and often more than anything, it always comes with a subscription. So it always costs everyone um, a lot more money for things that we don't really need. Um, I saw a bit of data the other day where it kind of suggested on TeacherTap that students were using AI more than teachers, um, which I found quite fascinating. Um so the, we've got all the ethics and things, and I, st I still think it's unknown territory, but I'd like to believe whether it's in 10 years or in 200 years, we'll still have physical school buildings where parents will still need to ch send their child to a school to be in front of an expert who can not, you know, not just that expert in knowledge, but in cognition, child development, social skills, development, all those kind of things that we externally take for granted in the classroom where you're developing the whole child, just not what they know about science or maths or what have you. And um, AI will be a bolt-on add-on uh, as, a, as, as a result in a school or a classroom. It won't replace it. It'll be just something that's there. Um, I guess like mobile phones, you know, pho phones have been around for uh, two or three decades now, probably three decades or so. Um look what condition we are now in with our phones and you know, the amount of kids I see down the street with their faces in devices, not, we all do it ourselves, you know, and they got that kind of distractions on buses and tubes and things. We've got to, uh, we've got to get better at it. And uh, you know, the online harms bill from the government and things, there's just so much they've probably got on their plate. There's so much we can still do to protect us all, to improve how we all um, work and operate for a better society um, I, I guess it's complex, but it depends on where you want to go, really, with the future of mm. technology and its risks for, or benefits for teachers, parents, or kids. Yeah, it's the, I always liken it to to Lord of the Rings and the, the rings, you know, that we can't destroy, we can't use it to change things. We need to, we need to either destroy it, which is impossible, yes. or 
find a way of using it that works mostly to our benefit. I, yeah, I, I think, think so. Dangers. Uh, there are dangers, but we need to we need to be aware of what they are and control them. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, you know, when when it when all the Chat GPT stuff came out, the government were playing catch up, and there was yeah. no policy, so schools were creating their own. And I, I guess that's where innovation can also influence accountability rather than the other way around. So, you know, we'd, you'd like to hope we're in another place, but I, only a few months ago, when I submitted my views to the, the Department for Education for the AI. They come back with tweaks and things like that. So it's still, you know, new territory for them. Yeah. Um, I, I, some schools don't have AI policies. We've got the whole exam board kind of stuff that we still need to consider. Um, and again, we get back into exam territory. And then so if we're all going to sit on a computer and do an exam, which would make sense because it's quicker, remote self-marking, those kind of things, you've got all those hiccups about um, reliability, errors, hacking, kids using technology and blocking the chat GPD feature in the technology they're using the exam hall. So it's just a minefield. So I can see why the default to just stick a kid in a hall with some teachers walking around physically on a bit of paper with a pencil and there's your exam. Let's just test what you can recall from memory. Yeah. Um, so that's the issue, isn't it, though? That that's what we're actually testing of children. And that's until somebody with enough power and influence says, why, why are we doing it this way? It won't change because no. you know, the exam tests what you can what you can regurgitate in a certain period of time. And by that, we then say you are suitable for university or you're suitable for this. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Lord Jim Knight, and he's written some things for my work in the past about that selection that schools are through no want or will of our own, we, we naturally select kids for the next stage and off they go to the next stage and they get creamed and narrowed down to the next stage and then that ripples through into society. You know, we have, we have this, we've had this argument for decades, how do we celebrate all types of education, all types of qualifications, all types of careers? And I guess that ripples down into media and parental perceptions that if I want to be a plumber... You know, whether I'm using the word academic or creative still is debatable, but it's a rich and rewarding career. And I think what 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 I love most about the pandemic is that everybody played a part in society, whether it was someone emptying your rubbish, delivering your post, that you suddenly saw what makes society tip over is everyone's playing a small part. And it, 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 four years later, how easy we've forgotten that, those kind of important moments about how everyone contributes. It's interesting. Uh, um, we nearly getting to the end of this chat, but I, uh, <clears throat> I actually know a sort of very successful uh, entrepreneur running a digital business around refitting factories and, uh, uh, and home, homes in terms to make them greener. And he's, you know, it's, it's an online uh, facility, he's developed an app, and obviously he's got developers and everything. He, he doesn't have a problem getting developers. He has a problem getting young people who are skilled enough to actually build mm. wall. I mean, if I think of my boy, he's 13, he, he wants to be a graphic designer because he, his um, brother, in, uh, my brother-in-law, his uncle is, um, a graphic designer for MTV and also does all the, you know, if, if a footballer scores a goal on the TV and he comes on the screen and he's celebrated a goal, he does those animations. So that's inspired him. But, yeah. you know, when we moved to Yorkshire from London in the pandemic, he wanted to be a vet. So you can kind of see how your environment, whether it's online or physically, can shape your career. But it's, I find it always interesting how our, our children's careers are changing uh, and the opportunities, but also like the employers, you know, you've got these hybrid headaches to factor in. And also, how do you get people in the door? And if you think about, you know, Brexit and all those kind of where we might get workers in the past to pick a strawberry and we can't get those things anymore. Uh, how do we as a society make our young people uh, value all careers, want to experience different careers, not often just opt for these digital, you know, influencer type careers as well um it, it's a ch it's a challenge I, I think we've uh, you know that's another big conversation isn't it to unpick and before we go um i know you've got this uh, book out around feedback but what's the next one 
about. Well, the next one is I'm in two minds. My publishers want me to go with one title. I won't tell you which, but here are the two titles. I get asked. So I, I, for my guide to memory book, I got really fascinated about cognitive science and psychology a good decade ago. And particularly through the pandemic, I spent all my dog walks listening to brain lectures. And I used to get fascinated by brain anatomy and terminology. And long story short, I put it into the book Guide to Memory. Here's what I now know about the brain. And this is how I now work differently as a teacher. So I want to, as a result of that, I've ex experienced lots of parents and students always. How do I get my 13-year-old to revise? So I'm thinking about a, a book for revision techniques, but written for parents. Um, and I think that would be a nice friendly guide rather than a guide for students that are a teacher expert about brain anatomy and memory, helping parents encourage their kids. So that's one potential title. The second one is leadership. So yeah, I guess it draws upon my book, Just Great Teaching. I published that one just before the pandemic. That was based on what I see on my travels. Here's all these schools doing the exact same things, the same challenges, same priorities, but they deal with them differently simply based on their circumstances. So I thought, well, let me come back to that and look at leadership instead. So Guide to Leadership probably is going to be the next title. But I want to be a bit more broader, think about all my limitations in the past. If you think about the Department for Education regions across England, if I choose a range of leaders, primary, early years, secondary, in each of the regions – develop a sequence of structured questions and I revisit the 10 topics in the, the, that book, which are the usual priorities, curriculum, behavior, teaching and learning, mental health, et cetera. But I look at leader expertise and, and opinions and ideas on those topics by region, including diversity and gender. I can get a broad balance of current leaders in the, in the profession right now today of good practice. And it kind of mirrors what I see physically on my travels. So it'd be a kind of, push on from that blue book behind me, but kind of zooming in on individuals rather than schools schools specifically. Because we all know we can all choose a school that you want to work in. You can find them by chance, accident, or circumstances. Or occasionally you can get lucky and find a brilliant school because you've applied and you kind of count yourself lucky for the lottery. Um, so that's what I think I might do next. Yeah, again, it's a very niche topic. Uh, I don't think it would sell very much, but... I, I, I've moved past the kind of, yeah. I love writing. So if I can put it into a book, I, 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 my, my view on books now, which used to pay my pocket money when I was a school leader, they um, are just another resource for the website. So if a school leader happens to buy one, it often ends up being me inviting into their school to lead CPD. So I view uh, you know, that reward back there, at me delivering and being in front of staff in the future. So I write books for love, not necessarily for sales. Um, and I'm lucky enough that my publishers still want me to keep um, publishing titles. They want me to publish a lot more than I can physically manage. Um, my website's a full-time job. If I'm not at my desk here, I'm physically on my way to a school somewhere. Uh, and if I'm not doing all those things, it's three newsletters a week, <laughs> two <laughs> two blog posts a week, uh, the odd video here and there. If I've got time to stick something on Twitter, I will. Um, and then there's all the other things that we all love to do and get distracted on the news and on socials and things like that. But it's all it's all good fun. Well, it's, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> I think part of your, your book, Ross, should be on leadership. You, you're saying about being able to choose, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you choose the right school. Maybe you get into the right school by fluke. But as a leader, you can make the right school. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. And that's what Your I see, choice. you know, yeah. and what I love more than anything is you have a, a wide range of leaders that create their schools or find their schools by accident and a mixture of circumstances, personalities that are in the school, the locality, the kids that they have, you know, you can make your culture, but it take. we all know it takes a bit of time. It's whether those external factors results and in inspections can support that process and that journey or get in the way. Uh, and, you know, we have, we've got all the multi Academy trusts and all those kind of headaches we've not even spoken about, but, um, yeah, I, I admire any any person that steps up to headship. I wish I had the gusto to have done it. Um, I suppose in some respects my teacher toolkit life took me that step beyond mm -hmm. what a head teacher might do after they retire. Um, so I guess I missed that step. But I feel 
I feel richer for having visited a lot more schools on my travels. I feel also that I'm valid in some shape or form because I can support so many teachers globally in some respects rather than just me and my own little school. Um, and that's been about a lot of my imposter syndrome over the last few years about how do I still contribute and be valid. Um, but I've navigated that gradually and I, I, I'm in a strong place. Um uh, it'd be interesting to know what happens next. I've got to think about teacher toolkit in the next 10 years. Um, you know, do I turn it off? Do I give it to someone else? I've turned four investors away. So I've got to think about what I would do in the future. Uh, and you got all the business headaches, all the tax and all those things, which I don't enjoy. But um, yeah, maybe I'll just turn it off and hide in a hole for a bit and then just come back as something else. But <laughs> finish it though, which is a, um, a colleague that I know as a very successful business, but they're that they want to sell it because they've got what they think is an even more exciting project. Yeah, which the current business is stopping them from doing. You know. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm a bit in that situation myself. Also, I've got um, I, I get a lot of teachers that have left the profession come my way who speak to me in confidence because I'm you know I'm I'm a solo identity. I, I have to hold myself to account. You know, mm -hmm. safeguarding and ethics and whatever else. I have to make sure that. My old, my old, older kind of binary views about state education and private and all that, it's much richer than it was before. Um, I also think that all the people I work with, past, present and future, are my clients and I have to respect their decisions and all the brilliant things that they, they do. So I often, you know, it's that suggestion questions, why, why could we do this or how do you do that rather than saying, why are you doing it that way, Frank and Stan? Um, and, and yeah, the the... The next idea, I, I get a lot of teachers who don't know what to do next. So if I could bottle everything that I've learned in business within education in the last eight years, how do you raise your first invoice? How much do you charge people for? How do you deal with your tax? How do you reduce your pension costs? Um, what happens when you're sick and you're working self-employed? Who pays you? Um, anything and everything to managing data, to privacy policies, to develop a website, building a brand, it's all here, and I'd like to uh, I'd like to document it. So I've got an, an idea. We've got a website already in place. We've not launched it yet, um, but we're close to getting to a point where we might have our first physical conference in Manchester, right. where we can help teachers that um, are, are, I guess, lacking that confidence. Not not encouraging people to leave, but when they have left, how do they recognise the skills and assets they already have? And how can they switch that into another way of working within education, supporting the system? Well, I, I, Having done that later in later in life and and resigned and set up my own own business, those simple questions that you you just sounds as though you should be able to answer them like that. When yeah. you just sat on your own thinking, well, I I didn't know that invoices all had to be individually numbered in, and in <laughs> and, and if you if you uh, it's like you know when stands the time of the month when it's not great for Stan is when the VAT returns or whatever. Yeah, I'll get yourself a good accountant. Yeah, sure. I have I have got yeah. a good accountant. Well, I say that. I've had four accountants, and every time I get a new one, it's because the last one didn't tell me something quite critical yeah, that well, they should have. Right, well, let's, let's as we're moving off there, aren't we? So, yes. I'd also I'd love to, if you can keep, well, I'm, I'm on your website, so no doubt you'll, publicize that event in Manchester, I'd be very interested. I, I shall, yes. And thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back in a year or two's time just to see where we're up to. And uh, Yeah, so thanks for having me. Keep up the good work. Well, yeah. thanks, Ross, and congratulations on how far you've got. Yeah, thank you, Stan. The, the future still looks bright after that. It still looks red. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, until the next spotlight. Uh, thank you, Ross, at uh, Teacher Cool Toolkit. So uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm.